Hello, Sir David Lamis, the MP for South End West, has written a political viewpoint article for the latest edition of the Lee Times. He joins me now to talk me through it. First of all, hello, David. Um, starting on hello. a light note, you celebrate the arrival of summer. You're hopeful that with the success of the vaccine programme, we'll be able to get back to many of our former freedoms. Is there anything you're particularly interested in uh, being able to do again? Well, Mark, we're now in the second year of all our freedoms being restricted and it affects us all in different ways. Me personally, as I'm a people person, I enjoy getting out and about meeting people. So last year and already this year, I'm desperately missing not meeting people, not attending events, not sitting at concerts, not visiting people in centres. I mean, there are so many things that, as I've been an MP for a good while now, I've got into such a routine of attending these occasions. And I, I know how much preparation goes into producing these events and not to be attending them. I found disappointing and frustrating. So I'm really looking forward to the relaxation of the restrictions and uh, I can only say again that uh, I, I, I'm not a scientist but as I think we all understand viruses mutate mm. and it's a war against them so we can't just say well we're going to put our lives on hold while this virus exists because it will exist forever we've got to learn to live with it mm. Uh, it, it's a big, big responsibility for any government to decide when to relax restrictions completely because what's the expression if you do your damned and vice versa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm very optimistic that soon, very soon, restrictions will be relaxed completely. But what I do know, Mark, is that our lives will never be the same again. I mean, for those who've lost relatives and friends and haven't been able to mourn properly with well, their lives, never going to be the same again. And um, for each and every one of us, I think that we've learned to live in a different way and that will have a deep impact on us all. So whether it's face masks, socially distancing, it, I, I do chuckle inwardly to myself. Um, British people are quite reserved. Um, we've never gone in for showing our emotion uh, in front of other people. Mm. So all this um, increasing trend of like that on either cheeks, it was never a British way, but sort of we, we've all grown accustomed to it. And yeah. I don't know, the hand in thing and all of that of course we haven't been able to do for a long time so it'll be um well i'll be fascinated to find out if those practices ever come back because it's always an automatic thing to shake someone's hand and not even to be able to do that is is difficult so i mean they're, they're very very small things the the real impact has been on businesses education education mm -hmm. health support and all those matters mm -hmm. and the sooner we get back to some sort of normality the better towards the end of the article that you've written you're um you actually say july the second is when you go back to face-to-face -face meetings again do you, do you think that will make a difference well look mark we're doing a zoom call today and we've all got used to it and uh, i think whatever happens we will have zoom meetings increasingly mm. uh, <laughs> no one will ever be able to use the excuse in the future i can't travel to you <laughs> i mean you can do zoom meetings in your car or even in the supermarket if you wanted mm. so i think that's going to free up people's availability but i do think with surgeries which you really do need eye contact with the person, uh, particularly if it's a new case. I think that physical 
contact, although socially distanced from the 2nd of July, is quite important. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to resuming uh, my surgeries in person. And um, the approach to my surgeries now, there are nine wards in the South and West constituency. And basically on a rotor basis, as you know, I have the surgeries on the first Friday of each month, the third Friday of each month, they will be uh, held in every part of the constituency. And people can find out where those surgeries would be, not only through your good self, but they can just go to my website and it's posted on there where the next surgery will be. And uh, we now are required to have appointments. I used to have a first come first serve basis, which um, may or may not have worked well, but at the moment until we're completely clear of these coronavirus pandemic restrictions, then it'll be on an appointment basis. In your article, um, you do actually mention that um, you're available to um, offer help to people um, with on a whole range of things from, you know, pandemic related family matters, education, business viability. What things are you actually able to do to help people? What can you do? Well, Mark, let me say immediately, people don't have to wait to surgeries for me to help them with their problems. I was sitting in my office at the House of Commons last night at eight o'clock and the phone went. And it was a constituent obviously thinking I was gonna be at the House, House of Commons at that night, but I was. But um, I do actually have another life. <laughs> um, I can help people in so many ways. The power of the green headed note paper with the portcullis may not have quite the resonance that it once did because unelected people increasingly seem to be running the show and the uh, elected politicians seem to take the bullets for what are sometimes very bad decisions by unelected people and we're, and we're the four guys and girls. But, oh, I can make a real difference. So just in health matters, you know, if you haven't got your vaccine, I do know that my contacts in the health service uh, will immediately give me an answer to how the person can get it. If your operation has been delayed, uh, again, I can immediately find out the answer for that. If you feel that the diagnosis hasn't been done properly, I can immediately get uh, an answer for that very, very quickly. So I, I encourage people to come forward. Now on the business front, I think there's some sort of misunderstanding really of what is going on with support for businesses and the loans. Right. Uh, the local authority uh, doesn't have a lot of money. I mean, it has what it collects through the council tax, mm. which it spends on its core services. Uh, the government collects the money in through national taxation and it gives the money to local authorities to distribute according to some criteria now uh, it's entirely down to the officers who administer the allocation of grants in south end you know i'm not responsible for the management of these officers they should be following very close criteria, which the government has given them to work on. But unfortunately, I do perhaps too often get complaints from businesses who say that they feel they're being unfairly discriminated against in terms of these, shall I call them bounce back loans? Mm -hmm and that they feel that there's a tough interpretation of the criteria. Now, I have asked the local authority to publish how much of the money given them to the government has been distributed. I think South End and one other local authority, for whatever reason, were the only ones not to publish it. But anyway, we'll, 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 we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I, I say again, Mark, I'm not trying to get out of it, but I'm not responsible 
or mm -hmm. for the administration and interpretation of the grants. Mm -hmm. um, I support, very much support the government making the money available. Mm -hmm. And uh, the money is there to support businesses. Uh, we've just recently had the economic statistics for the country, which in all the circumstances are pretty good. But the loans exist there not only to support businesses, but to stop them folding mm -hmm. and to put them in a good position whereby when trading circumstances return to some sort of normality, the businesses can continue to trade. And I, I don't have to tell you, Mark, that in the area that I represent, there are a lot of these small traders and they badly need the support of these loans. Right, so then you move on. Um, you've been trying to um, get acceptable answers to the issue of numbers of people able to uh, attend funerals and weddings. How's, how's that going? Well, look, I think the people who run our cemetery in South End and the crematorium do a very good job under challenging circumstances. And of course, the uh, building is sort of very much 60s and it would cost a lot of money uh, to, to replace it. I don't know whether that's something the local authority might look at the future, but they are constrained by the size of the chapels at the moment. And there has been some disquiet about the rigidity of the uh, 30 people attending rule. Well, of course, that's now been relaxed. Mm. But I think Southend Council made the point, well, David, we can only work the size of the building. Mm. But hopefully there will be some movement on that. You know, for goodness sake, if anyone thinks there's special treatment, you've only got to look at the Queen. Uh, I mean, it couldn't have been a great big place, the chapel wins, and there she was sitting on her own. And looking very very sad so i think i i very much understand the distress about funerals because it's the only opportunity you, you have to express your upset at um losing someone who was so important to you on weddings i think there's two angles there's the personal side the emotions the bride and bridegroom go through through cancelling, rescheduling, cancelling and rescheduling. So there's that emotion, which has a knock-on effects to the bridesmaid, the groomsmen, the families and all of that. And then, of course, there's the business side with all the associated businesses supporting weddings. It's not just venues, it's the people who supply the dresses, the suits. So it's been very, very troubling I, I think some people have thought, well, a wedding is a wedding. You know, the prime minister decided to have his wedding in the way he did. And I now know firsthand it was a very small event. Um, but I do hear from lots and lots of uh, constituents who were looking forward to June the 18th and the re relaxation because 30, well, however many it is, some people want a larger wedding. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you decide <laughs> between individuals if you know, you've got 31 who are absolutely must be invited and it's restricted to 30. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's gonna be said to us on the 14th of June. I really don't. We hear noises mm -hmm. that there will be a relaxation of the wedding restrictions. I've got a vested interest in that because I, you know, two of my daughters are getting married this year. Right. So I'm just hoping, praying. But as I do live in the real world, mm. uh, whether it be funerals and weddings, I very much have first-hand experience of the distress these restrictions are causing. Mm. But I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. You go on and you highlight the uh, G7 gathering in the upcoming COP26 meeting. Um, what do you hope is going to come out of this, both for the UK and well, for the world? Let, let me say at the outset, um, Mark, 
it, it, it's extraordinary the timing of these events because from our country's point of view, it's brilliant timing. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have got the G7 in Cornwall and that we have got COP26 in Glasgow, mm -hmm. because that does mean that uh, these are the first really big event as we hopefully um, relax restrictions. And I think Cornwall, which is an area I particularly like, I know exactly where the meeting is taking place. Uh, I heard them talking about St. Michael's Mount last time. And as a scout, I can remember going to that area and literally paddling through the water to get to St. Michael's Mouth. Although if you miss time it, you might get stranded on the island, but it is very, very beautiful. It's not easy to get to. It's difficult by road and train, frankly, but look, it, it may work brilliantly because it's, it's beautiful. Uh, the weather is good at the moment and uh, it's such a tranquil setting. But what I'm more important, Mark, is that, um, we're back on the world stage. The endless arguments about the membership of the European Union are over. Any leader trying to resurrect that is not going to get a platform, frankly. It's all over. You've got to accept the situation and make the most of it. So it's very much in, our, in the interests of our former partners in the European Union to make a success of all this. And um, as I have some experience of dealing with the media, including yourself, Mark, uh, I'm sure the media would have loved to have had a row about sausages, would have loved to have had a row about uh, our relationship with Northern Ireland. But from what I've seen, the chemistry between our leader and the American leader is pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought the picture really of the two wives, it was like grandparents, <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah. paddling in the water. It, it, was, it, it, it was lovely. And I do think those personal relationships mm. mean so much. Mm. And uh, the previous relationship with the United States of America was tricky. Mm. It was unpredictable. And uh, I, I think, in a way, we've got back to some sort of normality. And that's what I'm certainly keen on, because this is so important. We've got to deal with our relationship with uh, Russia. We've got to deal with our relationship with China. We've got to deal with our relationship with our former partners in the European Union. And I want my country our country to lead the way. So I'm optimistic about the G7 meeting and, and looking forward, frankly, to COP26, because if anything, the pandemic has brought home to us all how precious the environment is. Mm. I mean, Mark, the birds are singing again in our gardens. Yeah. The wildlife is everywhere. Mm. As fast as I rearrange my pots, there's the squirrel burying their nuts. As fast as I, all the things in the garden, there's a fox upturning it or a badger upturning it. Yeah. So the wildlife has returned. And uh, I think that this is such a good opportunity at COP26 for us to lead the world in protecting uh, our precious environment. Because the reality is that unless India, China, and Russia, for a start, sign up to all of this, then we're whatever in the wind. Mm -hmm. And because I'm a big animal lover, I want our excellent standards in animal welfare to be shared with the rest of the world. And I don't want to see any more species put on the endangered list. So, yes, the timing of G7 and COP26 from our point of view is perfect you mentioned the local elections the number of uh, conservative councillors fell just short of an overall majority 
So rather than have a conservative led council or sorry, a minority led conservative council, you say the other parties decided to continue in an anti conservative coalition. That's an interesting turn of phrase. What are your thoughts there? Well, it isn't for me to interfere with the, lo the way the local authority works. But all I can say, Mark, is in the article, I presented the facts. <laughs> and the facts are we had local elections. Uh, my party did very well. There was a swing towards us and we gained seats. Uh, if you look at the other parties, some stayed the same and some lost seats. That's the reality of it all. So when I turned up at the mayor making ceremony, socially distanced, the last item on the agenda was to elect a leader of the council. And uh, there were two contestants, a conservative contestant and a Labour contestant. If you add up, up all the numbers, um, there was a possibility that uh, the Conservative contestant uh, could have won by virtue of not all the other parties either abstaining or voting against a Conservative candidate. Um, and there was the other alternative that the Labour contestant would get support of all the other parties joining together um, and, and supporting a Labour administration. Well, what happened is that the uh, other parties voted in such number that they supported a Labour administration. Now, I'm not going to get into an argument whereby um, those people in wards who voted for a particular party um, may or may not have signed up with continuing to have a Labour control council. Who knows what is in someone's mind when they go to vote. But the Conservatives could have led a minority administration by which um, I mean uh, people argue about coalitions. It's very challenging really to deal with a group of parties rather than one party. Because when you've got a group of parties, I mean, if you look at the parties, they, they don't all have the same philosophy. They will say, well, we do, David, it's the good of the town. Well, you can argue what the good of the town is in, in my news and I would be happy to, to do that. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that any parties stood on the platform that they wanted uh, people to vote for them. And um, they also wanted them to support them going into a coalition. And I think from the Conservative Party's point of view, they uh, feel that they want to be straightforward with the electorate. If you vote Conservative, you will get the Conservative-led administration. That's how I see it. And we'll, we'll have to um, wait to see how it turns out over the year. Uh, I mean, it could be that the mayor will end up with the casting vote. I, I, I don't know, there are so many twists and turns in all of this, and that might be quite tricky. What I assume it does mean is that um, local authority officers will presumably have quite a considerable amount of power uh, because they haven't, in one sense, got just one boss. They've got a number of bosses working together who might not always be singing the same song on a particular issue. So it is a confused situation, but uh, mm. there we are, Mark. That, that was the result of the mayor-making ceremony. You go on to talk about the... Uh, Queen's Platinum Jubilee, the contest 
for city and city of culture status. I know that's something that you've been very passionate about for a long time. So could you tell me one, why you think it's important and two, why you think Southend deserves it? Yeah. Well, I am an unashamed royalist. I think the uh, Queen is the best monarch ever. And the reason I can say, Mark, she's the only monarch I've known during my lifetime, <laughs> because I was born the year she came to the throne. Wow. And I think she is an amazing lady. And to have been on the throne for that long is just incredible. So I'm, I'm, I'm very sad that her husband is no longer around as you know i'm I, i'm very fond of centenarians yeah. and uh, of course he would have been 100 this week and it, it's it's a shame really that he never made it but you know the queen is so stoic she carries on regardless and i'm looking forward to the celebrations next year and i know from other jubilee celebrations in south end west whoever's the mayor i used to go around to all the garden parties and street celebrations we had and i i mean it's not for me to organise them, people just organise them and they were wonderful events. Mm. And I'm looking forward to that happening. But in particular, I'm looking forward to the two contests. Now, I've got no idea what the local authorities' intentions are about these matters. But uh, we were the alternative city of culture. All the work has been done uh, for that already. This time in the contest, they're saying that you can join with other areas in terms of wanting to be the city of culture uh, and to me it would make sense that I, I, I so what I'm saying Mark I, I think it would be unwise to put all our eggs in one basket right and I do think that uh, in the city of culture bid uh, all the work's been done there because you could join up with other areas along the Thames estuary that would be the uh, obvious celebration you could imagine the wonderful, wonderful celebrations, mm. not only inland, but along the Thames estuary. It, mm. it would be fabulous, but so much more important because the next bid is forever. And that South End becoming a city. And the reason I think it's important is that as we come out of the pandemic, uh, the economy has taken such a big hit in all sorts of areas. And if you are a city, you've only got to talk to areas who were towns and become a city. They say it's a no brainer, David. Once you're a city, you, 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 you attract investment much, much more readily than would otherwise be the case. There seems to be a bit of misunderstanding among certain members of the general public. They think you, you have to have a cathedral. You don't. Um, but if we wanted a cathedral, um, it, it will be St Mary's Church Pridlewell, which is as good as any number of cathedrals, frankly, throughout the country. You don't need a cathedral. In terms of the size of the population, we're there. We've got more than enough people to be a city. And I do think that a city status uh, means it sort of um, builds up people's self-esteem and uh, is is gr of great kudos, frankly. And it, it, it won't cost um, much money, frankly, to put in a bid. So I think it would be a complete no brainer not to have city status. And I've already got uh, my face mask printed, saying make South End a city. I wish you had it to show us. I the end of this mark i'm going to get the face moths and show it to you oh brilliant do i appreciate that that'll be really good getting close to the end we've got the dame vera lynn uh memorial launch which you say proved to be a success and you're very pleased with it as it's going can you tell me a bit about that now please well uh vera lynn for me is such a remarkable woman hmm. Throughout her long life, she managed to lift spirits mm. during the darkest hours of the Second World War. And you and I, Mark, were not around then. Mm. But we know from our parents how grim it was. And coming from London, as I do, I heard from my parents about 
hiding in air aid shelters at the bottom of the garden, having the roof blown off of the property and all that. Mm. And it is amazing, you know, when you're down, you might be on a coach and everyone says, let's have a sing song. Mm. Well, Vera, through her wonderful voice, started these sing songs, mm. but she got off her backside. Yeah. And without being a precious celebrity, she went out to the Far East, mm. not under glamorous circumstances as celebrities do today. Mm. She really roughed it. Mm. And if you look at the footage and see the smiles on the faces of our troops, it's just, just wonderful. Mm. And I think, as I say, it wasn't just a one-off. She didn't do something for a few weeks, a few months. She did it over seven decades. Mm. But after the World War, on various important occasions, you would see everyone gathering at Buckingham Palace and the royal family on the balcony, swinging away, singing, we'll meet again, mm. bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. So this project, we've had a fantastic response already. And the money is already coming in because it's not public money. It's individual subscriptions paying for this memorial. And it's going to be at the top of the White Cliffs of Dover uh, in an amphitheater, which I think is wonderful. So it's uh, built out of an actual bowl there. Mm. And you will see Dame Vera's statue probably with service people gathered around her feet and she's standing like that, singing. And when the amphitheater is operating for concerts, what it means is if people care to glance up, there's Vera looking over them. But just as important, there she is looking over the channel. And uh, when you come on a ferry uh, from wherever it is, I don't know, Belgium you might be coming from or, or France, mm. then what's the first thing going to greet you? Yes, it is the White Cliffs of Dover, but there's Vera looking over you. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm thrilled with the sort of support that we're getting for this project. Dover Council have been wonderful and the general public are being marvellous. And we've got a number of celebrities back in the project. And I'm very, very pleased about that. You did send me the link to the video that you had made a while ago. We've been putting it on the website very frequently since we last spoke and I'll carry Thank on doing that. that. Yeah, well, the, the video uh, for the final launch of the appeal on the 18th of June is being put together. Right. And uh, it's going to be premiered at 11 o'clock on the 18th of June. But we will make sure you, Mark, have it so that your wonderful readers can click on to it and enjoy. That'd be great. The occasion. Right. So actually, we've been all through the article that you've written uh, and I appreciate that a great deal. Is there anything else particularly that you'd like to speak about or that you would like to say? 750 words isn't a great deal and that's very much what's in my mind with being able to sit and chat to you now. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, look, um, I think what I would like to say to people is that um, summer is now with us. It was very wet in the build up to summer. So hopefully we won't have a drought this time, but we're enjoying good weather. And I want everyone, once the restrictions are relaxed, to keep safe and to be careful because the last thing we want to happen is an autumn and winter explosion of a new variant of the virus. But about putting all that aside, I want to hear from people. If I can help them with their many and various problems, they might think, oh, he's too busy to worry about that. You'd be surprised. And I normally know the right person to refer it to. And then I want everyone to get behind city status because whether it be culture i want to hear from all our choirs our actors actresses 
sculptors, dress designers, cooks, all of that to help with that. And also to come up with their ideas about the city bid. So I, I want the resident, you know, we all think, uh, we, we, we all look forward to events. We've, we've got the sport in summer, which I hope we'll see triumphs. You know, fingers crossed for the English football team for the start. Football coming home and all of that. I want England to do well. I'm, the Olympic Games, I'm the chairman of the all-party parliamentary group for the Olympic Games. So I'm, I'm overseeing the parliamentary input in, into that. And there's no doubt at all that uh, sporting activities do tend to cheer the nation up as long as we're doing well, of course, mm. <laughs> which uh, I, I hope we will. So I want people to keep uh, positive and bright. But I think, Mark, I need to go and get the mask, don't you? <laughs> I think you should. I think you should indeed. Go on then. <laughs> I had a question to the Prime Minister this week, Mark, but you're not allowed to wear masks with messages on. <laughs> but there we are. That's brilliant. I like that a lot. Fantastic. Some people would say that's a huge improvement, David, of how you <laughs> normally look. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate that. Is that OK, Mark? Very much so. Very much so. I appreciate you taking the time, David. I really do. Bless you. Thank um, you, Mark. Thank you. Take care.